Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I've been using my ASI 294mm for 14 DSOs and 7,000 subframes, so I thought I'd stop down here for a moment and give you some first impressions. I haven't had an opportunity to go through all of the data and process all of the frames. I have been through some of the DSOs at least once, and I'm liking the results, but I've had a few surprises as well. Let's get started. I have been using the ASI 1600mm, which has a 3.8 micron pixel size, but I was looking for a camera that had a much smaller pixel size in order to get more resolution out of my Red Cat 51 and my GT81. In bin 1 mode, I get pixel size that is on the order of 2.315 microns. And that should translate directly into a reduced full width at half maximum as seen by the, in the images. A second reason for getting this camera, and probably a reason why most of you have gone down this path before, is to take advantage of the improved tonal resolution of the 14-bit ADC in Bin 2 mode, and also the high conversion gain that allows you to regain the dynamic range and reduce the read noise if you get above a gain of 120 with this camera. And so that makes it very useful for an SCT, where the bend pixel size still leaves you oversampled for that kind of scope. And then finally, there's a geometry versus dollars. One of the things that I was wanted to avoid was buying a camera that had a larger frame size that forced me to then go out and buy larger filters and another filter wheel. So rather than incur that additional cost of $1,500 to $2,000, I wanted to stay within the same geometry that my 31 millimeter or one and a quarter inch diameter filters work with. Better spatial resolution for the small refractors and better tonal resolution for the SCT. Have the telescopes that I have, the Red Cat 51, through the SCT, the C925 SCT, corresponding focal links here in this third column. And then over here, you can see the camera that I will be using from now on with these telescopes. What I wanted to do was to get better image resolution, better facial resolution out of these two small diameter telescopes. Since I'm after detail with these two telescopes, I'm going to be using the Bin 1 mode to capture detail, such as would come from the luminance filter and the HA filter. But when it comes to just getting color, I'm going to use the RGB filters S2 and O3 in Bin 2 mode, and then combine those pictures with the Bin 1 detail images in order to get the final image. But ultimately, my final image will be in Bin 1 mode. I'm just going to stick with the ASI 1600 and the ED-102. And then finally, the SCT, which is a 2310 millimeter focal length. I can still be a little oversampled with an image scale of 0.41 arc seconds and rely solely on bin 2, which is where the, where the sensor advantages really are. I put out a video some time back when I first got the camera looking through the specs and deciding what my strategy would be and how I would use this camera. And here's what I came up with. The luminance filter is a detail filter, so I'd be using one by one binning. And for me, a 50 second exposure seems to work okay. With my RGB filters, when I'm shooting this for a galaxy, for example, I just want the RGB for color. So I'll be using the bin two mode, a hundred second exposure and staying with the gain zero. With the SHO type images, nebula, I'll be using the HA filter for detail. So now I'm back to the bin one mode and I selected a gain 100. You can listen to my rationale in the other video. I'll put the link in the description if you just want to go back and listen to that. There isn't much question about the gain when you go into the Bin 2 mode. You definitely want to, whenever possible, take advantage of gain 120 because that's when the high conversion gain kicks in and your dynamic range goes back up to uh, what it would be at gain zero, but you also get the benefit of low read noise at this gain level. So this definitely makes all the sense in the world when I'm shooting S2 and O3 for color to use the Bin 2 mode and a gain of 120. We're using mixed mode imaging for the Red Cat 51 and GT81, and we'll be in Bin 2 mode only for the SCT to take advantage of the better tonal resolution without loss of spatial resolution because we're still oversampled with that Bin pixel size. And going through the data that I've collected, there are a couple of things we need to talk about here. First, some lessons learned about combining Bin 2 images with Bin 1 images to come up with the final Bin 1 final image. And then second, something is going on with my RGB filters and the images I've collected with them in Bin 2 mode. I'm not going to belabor this too much. These are the imaging targets that I've selected for the Red Cat 51. As a general rule, you can see that for a typical uh, SHO target, I get hydrogen alpha in Bin 1 mode, 
I also collect a short period, less than maybe 20 minutes per filter for RGB in bin one mode, just so I'll have some RGB stars to replace the SHO stars with. And then on the color side, I have the O3 and the S2 filters taken in bin two mode. Whenever I'm shooting for detail, I'm using bin one. Whenever I'm shooting for color, I'm using bin two. And it's pretty much the same story with the GT81 and the six targets that I've shot over the past couple of months with it. Again, detail, I'm using the bin one mode and color, I'm using the bin two mode. I showed this graph sometime back in another video. I'm comparing the actual measured full width at half maximum with my AS size 1600 and the 3.8 micron uh, pixel size and plotting that on this graph. Now what you see down here is the theoretical full width at half maximum that's based solely on the wavelength of color you're looking at and the diameter of the aperture of the telescope. Theory means that it's in space. The telescope is in space. So we're not going to see this theoretical line. So now when I take a look at the data I've collected with the ASI 294 and the Red Cat 51, here's what that line looks like now. That's a significant improvement. The effective or measured full width half maximum that I'm getting out of my images now is down to a level where, frankly, I wouldn't expect to get much better than this. In other words, I'm getting as much resolution out of this telescope as I possibly can. With the GT81, the story is kind of similar. Again, I was getting much worse full width at half maximum with the ASI 1600, but with the ASI 294, I've dropped this line down to here. Bin one mode is really helping me out with the resolution for these two telescopes. For flats, I just set up an imaging sequence within Nina. I already have dark flats corresponding to each filter with these times. And then I just execute this imaging sequence and it goes through and captures the images at the appropriate times and then saves the files off to a USB drive, and then I get flats in bin one mode only. I don't take flats in bin two mode instead, because going from bin one to bin two is an averaging process. In other words, it's a smoothing process. It's perfectly okay to take flats in bin one mode and then just do an, an integer resample to get down to the bin two scale and then that way you can get two for the price of one with your flats. And then there's the amp glow calibration issue. As we all know, if you've taken a look at the darks from this ASI 294, the starburst amp glow is basically ridiculous. There's these streaks of light that go off basically a quarter of the width because this image here is, is, complete, is just a stacked image of uncalibrated frames. I also have a shadow of my off-axis guider down here in this corner. When I take the same data, calibrate, and stack it, I get this, and you can see we have this Getty Nebula here, and the flat frames have successfully eliminated the shadow down here in this corner. Most importantly, the dark frames have uh, eliminated any trace of that uh, ridiculous uh, starburst amp glow that this camera generates. For those of you who might still be holding off buying one of these cameras, I think the dark frames will solve the problem pretty effectively. This is a picture of the Heart Nebula, of course, taken with my ASI 1600. Now, this is probably one of the first images I took with the Red Cat 51 and my then new ASI 1600, plus the fact that I had no idea what I was doing with SHO processing. The image scale here is such that I'm not able to fully pull the Heart Nebula over far enough in order to get all of the Soul Nebula in the picture. Now, with the ASI 294 and the wider dimension of the sensor, but coupled with a shorter dimension in height, I am at least able to pull the Heart and Soul Nebula into the frame simultaneously. So in this case, the dimensions of the sensor actually work to your advantage. It does work to your disadvantage as well. We already saw the picture for the Spaghetti Nebula, and here you can see I've just captured all of the spaghetti nebula down here at the bottom of the frame, but because the frame does not have the height, I'm losing something on the height, I am therefore losing some nebulosity of the uh, spaghetti nebula up here. So I guess that's just something you have to learn to live with with this camera. And then there's the mixed mode processing that I'll be doing with my Red Cat 51 and GT81. What you're looking at here is a highly zoomed in uh, picture for the sulfur data from a target and I captured the data in bin two. I aligned it in bin two and integrated it. In other words, stacked the bin two data 
all in bin 2 mode and then resampled it up to the bin 1 mode. And this is what I'm seeing. Small stars are quite boxy and the larger stars come out more pixelated. Instead, I'm changing my approach and what I do is resample all of the bin 2 images until they've been calibrated up to the bin 1 level and then align and integrate all of those images at the bin 1 level to come up with the stacked image. And you can see here that these boxy stars are now more rounded because the stacking operation has spread light into adjacent pixels. Just remember when you're doing this mixed mode processing, calibrate the frames in their native bin. If you take the image in bin one, do all the calibration in bin one. If you take the image in bin two, do all the calibration in bin two. And now if you're going to combine your bin two images with bin one images, take all of the bin two data and resample each one of those images up to bin one and then do the alignment and integration at that point, the integer resample function within PixInsight doesn't have a file list. You can't just add a bunch of files to it and say, now go do all of these files. So instead, I've had to learn how to use the image container and process container tools within PixInsight to get this done efficiently. So let's go over to PixInsight just in case you haven't seen this and I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, so here we have a picture of the heart nebula. It's in bin two mode, it's an S2 image. You know it's in bin two mode because the pixel size is 4,000 something by 2,800. That's the size of the bin two data from this camera. We call up the integer resample process from the menu over here. And in this case, it's in its default configuration, but we want to upsample. We wanna go from bin two to bin one. In other words, we wanna double the number of pixels here. So we're going to click up sample and we're going to drag and drop this onto the image, resize the image. And now you can see we have 8,288 by 5,644 pixels, which is what a bin one image is with this camera. What we want to do is to apply this process to all of the images, but as you can see, there's no way to add a bunch of uh, files to do this with in kind of a, a batch operation. So here's what we want to do. We've already done the process that we want to do. So we can come over here to the, hist the History Explorer and pull out this particular image. There's only one image open, so it identifies it by default. And you can see what the process that we've applied is the integer resample. I'm just going to take this and drag it over here to the background, and that is our so-called process container. And now I want to create an image container that has all of the images we want to apply that process to. And so we're going to come down here, right click on the uh, background and pull out the image container. And now we just need to fill in the files that we want to do this with. And I'm going to go with the uh, S2 data from the Heart Nebula. So that's all of these files. And then we need an output directory, a place to put these things. And we can just come up here to the calibrated, and I'm just going to dump them here into this space. And then that becomes our image container. I will drag off an icon here. And now it's just a matter of dragging this icon, the process container, on top of the image container. And you get a check mark there, and you let it go. When you get done, you're going to have bin 1 versions of these bin 2 files. You can see now we get this date timestamp of the conversion, and you also get files that are now 182 megabytes. Lovely. Now for the scary thing that I've noticed. In some of the galaxy imaging where I'm using RGB filters to collect color, I'm using the bin 2 mode, I'm using a gain of zero, and I've been noticing very obnoxious net-like noise. Now, in this case, it's an image, obviously, of M33. I've really stretched the heck out of it to try to highlight the noise that I've been, I'm have been. i talking about here. So the size of it, if you want to think of, the, of a kind of a grain size of this noise, kind of an ellipse, that is uh, longer in one direction than the other. If you scale this out, it comes out to be like six arc minutes by two arc minutes. It's a really large scale kind of noise in terms of its size, and it doesn't seem to correlate with other types of motion. I thought about dithering as well, but let's face it, I don't see these artifacts in the luminance data in bin one mode. Generally speaking, if you see something in R, G, and B, you really see it in the luminance channel. I don't see it with my ASI 1600, and I've never dithered with that camera either. I have asked 
ZWO support about this, and they, they asked right away, are you dithering? I thought back to the sensor curves that I referred to in my earlier video when I was talking about the ASI-294, and I remembered that the read noise in bin 2 mode is like crazy bad close to gain zero. For example, what you're looking at here is a comparison of the ASI-294 with the ASI-1600. The blue line is the bin 2 mode of the ASI-294. The orange line is the bin 1 mode of the ASI-294. And then the gray line is the ASI-1600. And as I said, I've been using a gain of zero with my RGB filters in bin 2 mode. So that means I am getting slapped upside the head with read noise here. Maybe it's the read noise that we're seeing coming through. The difference in, in read noise between bin 1 down here and bin 2 up here is almost like a factor of 3. So my working hypothesis at this stage is that I'm looking at read noise from my bin 2 mode at gain zero. And I think what I'm probably going to have to do as we move into galaxy season when I'll be using bin 2 mode exclusively for those several months is that I'll be trying out uh, taking RGB data at a gain 120, which means that I've got to take my 100 seconds that I was using at gain zero and really cut that down significantly, maybe down to 30 to 40 seconds uh, exposure time for the RGB filters. So, so far, my observations with the ASI-294 is that I really am seeing a real improvement in image resolution with my Red Cat 51 and GT81. Now, of course, the file sizes are huge in bin 1 mode, but that's just the price of doing business with this camera. The more eccentric sensor aspect ratio with this ASI-294 is okay. It has some pluses and minuses. You can fit some targets in to the frame that you couldn't with the ASI-1600 then there are some targets where you can't fit all of that target into the frame that you could with the ASI 1600. So it's going to be a bit of a hit and miss thing with this aspect ratio. Overall, it's not a showstopper. I'm not having any issues calibrating out that hideous amp glow. The calibration does work. It works quite well, and there's no trace of it after you do an appropriate calibration. We demonstrated PixInsight's image container and process container. If you're going to be doing mixed mode imaging like I'm doing with my small focal length refractors, you definitely want to calibrate the images in their native bin and then use the image container and process container tools to convert all of those bin 2 files up to the bin 1 size and then do your star alignment and image integration. And then that will minimize any artifacts that you would otherwise get by taking just one stacked image image at bin 2 and upscaling it to a bin 1 image. And there is that anomaly. I'm going with the hypothesis that it's read noise. I'm hoping that I can prove that out here in Galaxy Season by just using the bin 2 mode at gain 120 and then cutting my exposure way down with the R, G, and B filters. That's just the story of astrophotography. You win some and you lose some. We'll see what Galaxy Season tells us. I'm sure we'll have some solutions to some things and new surprises about other things. But for now, I guess that's just about it. I don't have anything left to say. Clear skies, and thanks for watching. Take care.